Hey guys, um, today I'm doing a really quick video detailing how I build my own LED systems at home for indoor horticulture. Uh, building your own lights is something that seems daunting at first, but once you understand how LEDs work and how to set up their circuits, uh, you realize that it's actually so simple that you might never buy another commercial set of lights again. Uh, just a few things to know before we get started. You're definitely going to need a soldering iron and some regular solder. You're also going to need some solder paste and thermal compound. Uh, and if you can get your hands on either a hot air reflow station or a hot plate or stove with precise temperature control, that's going to make this process a lot smoother for you. Um, so without wasting any more time, let's get into it. Alright, these are starboards. They're basically small aluminum PCBs meant for a single LED each. I buy my starboards off of AliExpress and it cost me about $15 all in for 200 of these. And this is solder paste. Solder paste is a dense paste of flux and solder particles. You need to keep this refrigerated for storage, but let it warm up to room temperature before using it. It'll be easier to spread on your PCB when it's not cold. What you want to do is spread your solder paste over your starboard pads. It's okay if there's bridging across the pads. A part of the magic of having flux and solder is that it makes the solder flow towards metal. So unless you really overdo it, you likely won't get any solder bridging under your LEDs. When you're done spreading your solder paste on your starboards, don't forget to cap it and put it back in your fridge. Now it's time to pull your LEDs out and get ready to populate your boards. They usually come out messy when you pull them out of the package, so take a pair of tweezers and turn them all upright. If you're unsure about the polarity of your LEDs, you can check the manufacturer's product data sheet. You can usually find that on their website. On top of some LEDs, you'll also find a marking to denote polarity. On mine, for example, you can just barely see a positive symbol. It's so small and poorly placed that it actually looks more like a negative symbol from some angles. Here's a neat trick you can do with a multimeter for checking LED polarity. Most modern multimeters have a diode tester installed. Just switch the multimeter dial to the diode symbol and switch the mode if you need to. When you touch the leads to your LED in the correct orientation, your light should illuminate. Once you know your polarity for sure, you should make a mental note so you don't make any mistakes when populating your starboards. These Cree XPE LEDs, for example, have a black dot in the corner of their ground terminal side. Great! We're ready to populate our starboards now. Place your LEDs on your starboard pads in the correct orientation. Once you're done populating your starboards, just transfer them to your reflow station. I personally use a portable inductive cooktop with a heat transfer plate for reflowing, but you could use an old pan on a regular stove provided you can set the temperature or a hot air rework station. I'll admit, this is no way to make professional PCBs, but as a poor student, I used this method for years and it worked every time. Standard reflow temperature is usually about 240 degrees Celsius, and that's about 460 Fahrenheit. That's what I've got my cooktop set to, and you'll see it work its magic pretty soon here. To get more uniform heat transfer throughout your starboard strip, you might want to press down on the center with a pair of tweezers. You can see now that the reflow is starting to occur. What I like to do once the solder has reached its melting point is give the LEDs a little poke on the top. This will push any excess solder from underneath the LED pads onto the surface of the starboard. While you're doing this, you might accidentally push an LED off of its pads. That's fine, you can just use a pair of tweezers to put it back in place. Finish up tapping your LEDs down and power off your reflow station. Move your starboards over to another surface to cool. Before assembling my lighting circuit, I like to test my starboards with a multimeter. I also like to use a pair of tweezers to scrape off any excess solder on the side of the starboards. This isn't really necessary, but it does make the final product look better. My heat sink for this project is a 1 inch by 1 inch aluminum squared tube cut to length. I've simply drilled and tapped the holes required to fasten these starboards down with 632 nylon machine screws. If you're going to use screws, I've found that using a non-conductive screw is quite important for these starboards. It's pretty easy to get short circuits with them otherwise. If it's too much of a hassle for you to drill and tap holes, apply thermal compound, and order a set of nylon screws, 
you might want to look into using thermal epoxy as an alternative for fastening your starboards to your heat sink. One thing to make sure of when you're fastening your starboards down is to make sure that they're all in the same orientation. Once your starboards are secured in place, it's time to heat up your soldering iron. I like to put some solder on the pads before I begin soldering the wires. I find that the solder flows better around the wires when there's already some on the pad. Now you just solder your wires to the starboards. You want to make sure that you always start on a positive lead and end on a negative lead. You definitely don't want to reverse bias any LEDs. I find this job goes a lot easier if you have a pair of tweezers uh, that you can use to bend the wires if they're too long and hold them down to the pads while you're trying to get them fastened. It doesn't really matter what wire color you use to link your LEDs, but for end terminals you should definitely use longer color specific wires. In DC circuits, black is usually convention for ground, while red is usually convention for positive. Now that these are hooked up, I'm just going to use the diode tester on my multimeter to make sure that they're still working properly. Now these LEDs are ready to hook up to a power supply. When choosing your power supply, you really only need to concern yourself with two things. Look at the maximum drive current of the LEDs and their nominal operating voltage. These can both be found on the product data sheet and sometimes directly on the manufacturer's product webpage. My LEDs have a typical maximum forward voltage of 3.1 volts and a maximum drive current of 1 amp. Okay, something to know about LEDs. They're current controlled devices. Their current changes very quickly with slight changes in voltage. And as they heat up, which they will, they become less efficient and their voltage demands decrease as the drive current remains constant. Now you don't have to try and make sense of what I just said, but trust me, that if you try to drive a high power LED with a regular DC power supply that provides a constant voltage, your LEDs will draw more current as their temperature increases and you'll likely exceed their maximum rated current and permanently damage or destroy them. What you need instead is a special power supply designed specifically for LED lighting called a constant current power supply. These power supplies maintain a constant current over a large range of possible voltages, I know that's confusing, so here's what we're using for this project. This is a Meanwell IDLC 25700. It's a constant current power supply worth about $20 that supplies a constant 700 milliamps of current over a possible DC load of between 25.2 and 36 volts. Our LED circuit for this project has 11 Cree LEDs in series with a maximum forward voltage of about 3.1 volts each, and we already saw that LED voltage doesn't change much with temperature. Since the LEDs are wired in series, we simply add all of their operating voltages to get the total voltage of the circuit. In this case, it's about 34.1 volts. So we're driving all of our LEDs at 700 milliamps, which is less than their maximum drive current of an amp, and the circuit is just within the stable voltage range for our power supply. That's it. The circuit should work. So now we can hook up our supply. Take a standard wall plug and carefully strip enough of the jacketing to expose the wires. I like to use a soldering iron and some solder to tin the wire ends. If you have the tools, you can also crimp ferrules, depending on the power supply. When working with alternating current, you don't really have to concern yourself with polarity. Because the current is alternating, any given AC terminal is positive for one half cycle and negative for one half cycle. One thing to be careful of though is that you don't accidentally connect earth ground to one of the terminals. That'll definitely trip the breaker in your home. In North America, black and white are often used for live and neutral, and green is often used for earth ground. You'll have to look at how to connect the wires to the terminals for your supply. For these meanwhile drivers, there's a spring contact that holds the wires in place. Finally, be careful to connect your DC lines to your LED circuit in the right orientation, positive to positive and negative to negative. And please don't plug your supply into your wall until you've triple checked that your AC lines are connected properly and aren't going to come loose. Once everything's hooked up and secure, you can try plugging in your supply. And there it is. If you've done everything correctly, your light should power on and you should be ready to put them over your plants.
So hopefully you can go off and make your own lighting systems now. If there's something you'd like to see in future videos, please put your comments below. If you have a question, please ask. If you like these videos, hit that subscribe button, and if you love plants, stay tuned.